Good morning everyone and welcome to our parade service on this sixth Sunday after Trinity. We're going to begin by singing a hymn, King of Glory, King of Peace, which you'll find the words on the altar of service or in hymns on the new number 288. God our Father, we come to you in sorrow for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your will for our lives. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, forgive us, save us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For letting ourselves be drawn away from you by temptations in the world about us, Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. For living as if we were ashamed to belong to your Son, Father, forgive us. Save us and help us. May the God of love bring us back to himself 
Forgive us our sins and assure us of his eternal love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for he has heard the voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and in our song we will praise our God. activity this morning, I want to ask you one or two questions. Now of course you're not in the building to help me answer them and it would take too long for you to go on the chat and get your, uh, get your answers in to me uh, during the YouTube service but I'm going to still ask anyway and I've got a few prompts and you'll see why a little bit later on. Which films do you watch? What are your favourite films? What type of films do you like? Well, I interviewed a few young people living next door to the church and these are some of the answers that I got. First of all, one person said, my favourite films are war films. And most recently, the war film that he had watched was 1917. Now, I quite like war films as well, especially if they're actually films about what happened real historical films. But the desperate and sad thing is that so many people die. I mean, I suppose it's inevitable in war films that people are going to die, but it's so sad, it's so tragic. And especially in 1917, it's one of the heroes who dies during the film. Okay, I asked another young person living next door, and their response was, Horse films, anything to do with horses. And in fact, one person has been watching a series called Heartland, which is uh, not made um, on these shores. I I've been being a bit naughty and suggesting it's almost like a soap opera on horseback, like EastEnders on horseback, but I, I shouldn't say that. It's actually very, very good. But the whole series of Heartland, yes, it's about horses, but it actually starts with the death of Marion. And that's a significant factor that keeps coming up in the programme. So, wonderful series, but death is at the heart of it. I asked another young person next door, what type of films do you like? Disney films, she said. Okay, any particular Disney film? Yes, Frozen. There it is, Frozen. But, in Frozen, Elsa dies. So we can't escape death, whatever type of film that we're watching. It's so, so sad. Now I know that in all these films, it's actors playing the parts, and they will get up at the end of the film and walk away. But the feeling it lives with us watching it is, oh no, another person has died. We desperately, desperately, desperately wanted a happy ending, but we have to confront death. Then I asked another person, and their favourite film was Back to the Future. And I had to think for a minute, Back to the Future. I don't think anybody dies in Back to the Future. You think somebody dies in Back to the Future in chapter one, but actually they don't. So here at last was a film with a happy ending because no one died. And then I thought about myself, and I racked my brains, and I thought, what is the most favourite film for me that I've ever watched? And I have to say, my favourite film of all time is probably The Railroad Children, the original version made in 1970. And it's a wonderful story because no one dies in The Railroad Children, which is brilliant, but also, and this is totally relevant to our subject this morning, um, the children's father in the Railway Children is imprisoned falsely. He's falsely accused of things, obviously, that he didn't do. And the film ends so happily when he is released from prison and he meets his wife and his children once more and no one dies. I want you to hold that thought as we go through our service and in a few minutes time you will see why I've asked you these questions. Thank you. Now, Sarah's going to read to 
us from the Old and the New Testaments, which will help to set the scene of our theme today. The first reading is taken from the book of Amos, chapter 7, beginning to read at verse 7 to verse 15, and can be found on page 891 in the Old Testament part of the Bible. Amos, chapter 7. A vision of a plumb line. I had another vision from the Lord. In it, I saw him standing beside a wall that had been built with the help of a plumb line, and there was a plumb line in his hand. He asked me, Amos, what do you see? A plumb line, I answered. Then he said, I am using it to show you that my people are like a wall that is out of line. I will not change my mind again about punishing them. The places where Isaac's descendants worship will be destroyed. The holy places of Israel will be left in ruins. I will bring the dynasty of King Joabim to an end. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, then sent a report to King Jeroboam of Israel. Amos is plotting against you among the people. His speeches will destroy the country. This is what he says. Jeroboam will die in battle, and the people of Israel will be taken away from their land into exile. Amaziah then said to Amos, That's enough, prophet. Go on back to Judah and do your preaching there. Let them pay you for it. Don't prophesy here at Bethel anymore. This is the king's place of worship, the national temple. Amos answered, I am not the kind of prophet who prophesies for pay. I am a herdsman and I take care of fig trees. But the Lord took me from my work as a shepherd and ordered me to come and prophesy to his people Israel. So now listen to what the Lord says. You tell me to stop prophesying, to stop raving against the people of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. second reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 1 beginning to read at verse 3 to verse 14 and that can be found on page 240 in the New Testament part of the church Bibles. Ephesians 1 verse 3 to 14. Spiritual blessings in Christ. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in our union with Christ, he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ, so that we would be holy and without fault before him. Because of his love, God has already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his sons and daughters this was, his, was for his pleasure and purpose. Let us praise God for his glorious grace, for the free gift he gave us in his dear Son. For by the blood of Christ we are set free. That is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth, with Christ as head. All things are done according to God's plan and decision, and God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ because of his own purpose based on what he had decided from the very beginning. Let us, then, who were the first to hope in Christ, praise God's glory. And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people. And this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Sarah. Now, we're going to sing uh, a song before the Gospel reading. You are the King of Glory, you are the Prince of Peace. Hosanna to the Son of David. It's a, it's a great song. I'm going to grab my guitar and go next door where um, the rest of the Law Family Band are waiting to record the song. Of all his guests. 
So he sent off a guard at once with orders to bring John's head. The guard left, went to the prison, and cut John's head off. Then he brought it on a dish and gave it to the girl who gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard about this, they came and took away his body and buried it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our deed. Well, how John the Baptist met his end, I think you're a bit surprised. I must confess, well, I wasn't surprised about the reading, but what I was surprised about is it's not the usual uh, story for a Sunday morning reading. And in fact, I was very, very shocked to discover that many churches actually leave out this part of the Gospel according to Mark in their Sunday readings when they're working through Mark's Gospel throughout the year. Perhaps they don't want to talk about it, or perhaps they don't want to have a story that, on the face of it, doesn't have a happy ending. Well, let's look at the story first. King Herod, actually Herod Antipas, who was the son of Herod the Great, and he was the ruler of Galilee, the northern part of Israel. He has heard about Jesus' mission, and he's heard that Jesus' disciples have been sent out two by two to speak about Jesus in every village and town in Israel. And he's disturbed when he hears this, because some people are saying that Jesus is actually John the Baptist come back to life. That's how he can perform all these wonderful miracles. Herod is distressed. Herod is troubled, because he had personally supervised John's execution. He didn't want to do it, but he was pushed into a corner where he had to. I'm sure you know the rest of the story. Herod had taken his brother Philip's wife, which was against God's laws. John kept telling him publicly that he was a sinner. He should not have married Herodias while his brother Philip lived. Eventually, Herodias persuaded Herod to lock John up because he was really beginning to annoy them. Herodias' daughter danced for Herod at a birthday party and it pleased him and he offered her anything up to half of his kingdom. This was their chance. Mother and daughter colluded together and asked for John the Baptist's head. On a dish. Sad ending? Well, in the story it was very sad, very sad for John. But actually, lots of good will come out of the bad. First of all, John had come to prepare the way for Jesus. And even Herod was moved by listening to John speaking. He convinced people that the Messiah was coming, the Chosen One, the one they'd all been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds of years, to free them and to bring God's love into their lives. So even though Herod had done a terrible thing, there was still hope that he might be influenced by the message and change because he was listening to John. And as a result of John's preparation, Jesus and his disciples were able to take the message to the people and be well received because people knew that they were coming. Publicity in advance. And John himself gave up his own life in preparation for Jesus, giving up his life on the cross for the whole world. Jesus died for all those who had lived before, for those who were living at the time, and for those not yet born, which includes all of us. And best of all, Jesus was raised from the dead to give us the gift of life. So the story didn't have a sad ending. Yes, Jesus died, but Jesus rose from the dead. And, better still, when he returns, we too shall be raised to life. And John the Baptist will be raised to life, along with all of God's people, and we will be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Bring it on. Jesus 
brings us home. Amen. Now we're going to make our declaration of faith together. We believe in a wonderful God who reveals himself as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. So perhaps if you've been sitting down listening to me, you might want to stand and join with me in this declaration of faith. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. seated and we're going to come to God with our prayers for today. And we'll use the response, Lord hear us, Lord graciously hear us. First of all we pray for the church across the world, a church that is trying desperately to communicate God's love to a world that's caught up with the pandemic, still struggling with terrorism still struggling with war and sometimes doesn't want to hear good news. This week specifically we pray for the church in Mexico, the United States of America, the Philippines, Rwanda, Korea, North India and Cyprus and the Gulf. In our own Diocese of Chelmsford we pray for the Deanery of Chelmsford and our Bishop, the Right Reverend John Perumbalath, the Bishop of Bradwell and our Diocesan Bishop the Right Reverend Gulli Francis de Quine. And in our parish of Pixie with Nevender, we pray about our church, both of our churches, and about our desire to restart reaching out into the community. We wait with excitement to see how the government are going to ease restrictions in the next few weeks and how the Church of England will respond to that. We pray for those people bringing their children for baptism as we restarted the baptism services. And we also pray about those couples who are preparing to get married. It's a difficult time, but ahead there are times of joy. Lord hear us, Lord graciously hear us. We pray for our world, and especially for this country and for the NHS, and we ask, Lord, that you would help them, even though the government are saying that things are going to be uh, less restricted, we know that the infection rate is rising and more people are dying. And we pray that the NHS and the people of this country would be able to cope with that. And we pray that people wouldn't get angry and start shouting and screaming because of this disease. Help us to turn to you, Lord. Help everyone to turn to you for help in this situation. Lord hear us, Lord graciously hear us. We pray for our community, our parish here in Pitsy with Neverton, and we pray especially for our uniformed organisations, for the Scouts, Cub Scouts and Beaver Scouts, and for the Browns. We know Lord just how difficult the time it's been for them in this last 18 months. And as they look forward to restarting face-to-face -face meetings, we pray that you be with them. Help them to rediscover their joy and their enthusiasm for working together. Lord hear us. Lord graciously hear us. And we pray for individuals. There are lots and lots of names on our list. Perhaps if you've got the notice sheet, you could just look at those names for a few minutes of silence as we bring them before the Lord. Lord hear us. Lord graciously hear us. 
and we pray for the bereaved. We do pray especially for Lorraine following the death of John O'Leary. And we pray for all those whose uh, families are facing funerals this week. And we pray especially for those who are bereaved as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. conclusion of our prayers, we're going to sing a song together before we say the Lord's Prayer. Um, Father God, I wonder how I managed to exist without the knowledge of your parenthood and your loving care. So you'll find it in Psalms of Fellowship 92 or Hymns Old and New 119 or the words on the organ service. And you can sing son or if you're a, a girl, you can sing child as we sing the song. I'm just going to join the rest of the band.
and let you know whether or not that's going to go ahead. If it does go ahead, please be assured that everything will finish in plenty of time for you to get home by 8 o'clock and get the uh, TV set on, ready to watch the match. You may have noticed this morning at our parade service, I did insist on having St George's flag on parade, um, as well as the Union flag, because it's a very, very important day for England. Now, if the weather forecast is no good, and, uh, and we don't meet outside this afternoon, there will be um, a spiritual communion service live on Zoom at half past six, and once again, I can assure you, it will finish well before it. Now, tomorrow, Monday, um, our Bible study returns at 12.30 on Zoom, for those that would like to, to join in with us. Um, this week, our midweek reflection is on Thursday, at 10 o'clock on Zoom. The details are on the Board of Service. And there's also a burial of ashes up at St Peter's Churchyard um, this coming Thursday as well. Then next Sunday, oh, just to say, sorry, there's no youth fellowship on Zoom this week. Um, it's starting at the summer holidays. And there's quite a, uh, an important football match going on locally in Pitsy, um, which is being organised by T Cribben Sons. If anybody is particularly interested, do give me a call and I'll very happily pass on the details to you if you would like to go. Uh, so, as I say, no uh, youth fellowship on Friday night. Then next Sunday, Holy Communion as usual here in St Gabriel's at half past nine. And again, if you're coming to that, please, I'd be grateful if you could let me know. 11.15 will be our spiritual communion service pre-recorded on YouTube. At three o'clock, we have another Holy Baptism here in St Gabriel's Church. This time, it's Riley Ray Bridgewood who is being baptised next Sunday afternoon. And then, once again, our evening service of spiritual communion will be on Zoom. Unless we haven't made it to open air service, in which case it will happen next week. I'm determined to do it one time when uh, the weather is good. Also, uh, one thing to share with you, and that's uh, congratulations are due. I'm a very, very proud dad at the moment. Um, my daughters Miriam and Lydia both uh, graduated from uh, past their degrees in this last week, and I'm really, really pleased and really chuffed for them. Um, Miriam got a first, which is brilliant, outdoing her dad, and, uh, and Lydia has managed to equal her dad and got a 2 1, which is absolutely fantastic. And I'm really chuffed because, especially for Lydia, as she has been able to use a lot of the stuff that she's picked up in her film studies in helping to make these services get out to you. So uh, perhaps whether you're at home or wherever you are, we can give them a bit of a round of applause. That's true. Congratulations. Now, I don't want this to sound like the, uh, uh, the Law Family Show, but it's actually Ruben's birthday today. And I'm so chuffed that he's quite happy to spend his birthday um, doing stuff here for the church. So we're going to sing happy birthday to Ruben. If there are any other birthdays this week that I don't know about, please let me know and I will um, sing tonight or uh, we'll certainly sing next week. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Song, but I have put the words on the order of service 
And it's one of these kind of Israeli folk tunes that gets faster and faster and faster and faster as we sing it. So lots and lots of deep breaths. But I will return um, a little bit later on for the blessing and for the national anthem. Blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Now, if you have been sitting down, please stand and we'll sing the first verse of the National Anthem. <laughs> Stay in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. 